I'm going to talk about organizational culture, but in particular in the context of innovation, coming up with new stuff, new products, etc. Okay? So let me just check so I can calibrate what I talk about and how I talk about it. Who of you is from a startup environment, which means less than two years, because after two years you're not a startup, you're a failed company that can't scale. <laughs> That's what I was told. Who of you is from a startup, like you know, zero to ten to twenty people? Okay. Who of you is from a more established organization, mean, meaning you have maybe five years under the belt, you're maybe 500 or 1,000 people? Okay, who's beyond 1,000 people? Okay, great. So very mixed audience, so great. I'm not going to be able to calibrate, just you know, swing wild to the left and to the right. But there are a couple of things I've seen. Um, I mainly work with large organizations like Colgate, Mastercard, GE, Nestle. But I also love spending time with startups, so I can see both sides. And one of the things I'm seeing a lot is that large companies or established companies are trying to act more like startups, because that's how you create new stuff. You need to be agile, that's why you're practicing agile, etc. But there are constraints to that, so I'll talk mainly about that corner, which has to do with innovation culture. So let me just maybe start with sketching out the problem a little bit Who's been at one of my talks here in Berlin before? Hands up. Okay, great. So you might see some stuff again. Tough luck. But you'll also see some new stuff. I'll try to bring in a lot of the things that we learned. So what we're trying to do, you know, as organizations, new or established, is create new stuff. So my visual thinking skills are not great, like my joke, so I'll just label it. This is an idea. Okay? So when we have an idea for a new company, a new product, new value proposition, a product or value proposition we want to create around a patent we have, what are we trying to do? We're trying to go from idea, could be a market opportunity also, it doesn't have to be technology, to this, okay? So we're trying to go from idea to this. And here I'm going to try to prove my visual thinking skills. <laughs> Don't laugh yet. <laughs> Okay, anybody know what this is? We're going from idea to... Come on. Don't really? insult me. A house, yeah, right, okay. This is a one billion euro company. Can't you see that? Crystal clear. Hey, look, windows, flags on top. Great. So, traditionally, and of course you don't do this, is we say we're going to write a business plan or a deck that has some beautiful curve there higher up so the people in the back can see it, where we're going to show what we're going to do. Why is it worthwhile doing this? Either as a startup, we do it with uh, VCs, we want to raise money, or we sell it to our boss, um, or if we're the boss, we make that ourselves. Who of you has ever written a business plan? Hands up. Okay, who of you spent more than a day writing a business plan? Okay, that's the best way to waste your time. <laughs> so business plans are the worst possible tool to go from idea to business. They actually maximize your risk of failure. Okay? So, why is that? Because when you go from idea to business, the journey looks slightly different. It looks actually not linear. Then if it was linear, a business plan would be the best tool because it's about planning, the execution. But unfortunately, when we do something new, the journey looks more like this. You advance, you regress, you know, customers tell you your stuff sucks, okay? You don't realize how to make money, you might run almost out of money, out of funding, and eventually, through a lot of tears and failure, a lot of long hours, you figure out how to do it, and you're able to create that company, or that growth engine, that business unit, that new product, right? This is how innovation or creating new stuff looks like. Who's been through a journey like this? Do you think the business plan is a good tool to help you with that? Or even making up the numbers? Who of you has ever made a spreadsheet with great numbers for a new product or a new business? Okay, yeah. hey, right? Probably after a bottle of wine or in Berlin, probably beer. You made it up. It's a fantasy. So you don't go out and execute a fantasy. What you actually do, which many of you are probably doing, you follow a different approach. You say, this is a messy first part. Here we're searching for the right value proposition and business model. We're not executing because we don't know what's going to work. So basically what we're doing is we're designing value propositions and business models and then immediately 
we test them. And we test them quickly and we learn that we were completely wrong, not because we're ignorant, but because you can't get it right the first time anyways. You go back to design, so it's very iterative, so you kind of go through this like this, right? And then once you have enough evidence, right, lean startup approach, you start to execute, right? This is how creating new stuff looks like. That's the process of creating new stuff. It's very messy at the beginning, but you can orchestrate that. And the way we orchestrate that, or we show people how they can orchestrate that, is with tools like the Business Small Canvas or the Value Proposition Canvas. Who of you has ever used the Business Small Canvas? Right? Who of you has ever used the Value Proposition Canvas? Okay, those are tools that help you structure your thinking. And you've probably used it, who's used Lean Startup, the Lean Startup process together with these tools. Okay? You do that because you know you won't get it right, you test. So basically, draw this again, <clears throat> draw this again, a little bit like a test to see if you got it. Okay, we're going from, what is this? An idea, still an idea, to this. Remember what it is? Okay, now it's a two billion euro business. <laughs> Inflation. There's no, no more, there's two unicorns now. Okay, um, so that was a bad Swiss joke. It's a good example of a bad Swiss joke. Um, what we're trying to do is, we accept when we start out something new. And I'll get to culture in a bit, it's a bit of a long detour, but it's important. When we start out, what is at its maximum? We start out with a new idea, to build a new product, new value proposition, new company. What's, what's at its maximum? What's big? Excitement. Excitement, for sure. <laughs> That's the positive side. What's big on the negative side? Fear, okay, risk, okay? What's big is uncertainty. You don't know if this is gonna work. And risk, right? So you might have a vision, but you know what? There's a very fine line between vision and hallucination. <laughs> so the point is, what you're trying to do is to say, okay, I, I know that I don't know. So what is my task as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, as a product manager, or as an entrepreneur? My job is not to write a business plan, it's not to execute, it's very simple. Your only job is to minimize risk and uncertainty. So the question is, how do I do that? We said lean startup approach, etc. But what does that mean concretely? That means you're going to do small experiments, for example, talking to 100 customers, okay? Oops, we got into dollar signs here, wrong country. Okay. So you start testing small, it's cheap. Then you figure out you were wrong, you learn, and now, okay, you have a new value proposition, you might invest a little bit more in your first prototype. Maybe when you're building a technology platform, you now know, okay, it could be that these features or these features are important, can we actually do it? So gradually, you invest, and if you didn't realize this was a bag of money, just to be sure, okay, <laughs> gradually, you invest more money. Because every time you actually fail, and when, for example, customers tell you you were wrong, I don't care, I don't give a shit about your product, this is really irrelevant, I'm concerned about this, this is what I'm struggling with. Every time they tell you that, that's a victory. Failure is a victory, as long as it's small, manageable, and cheap, and fast, okay? So you decrease uncertainty by learning from the market, you invest more. You decrease uncertainty, and the more you in, 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 um, uh, decrease uncertainty, the more you can invest in experiments and ultimately execution, right? So there's an inflection point where we're going to execute. Okay, why all of this? Oops, I'm fall down here. Why am I showing you this? Very simply, because if we're in established organizations, this is the last thing people want to do if they want to have a career. Why? What gives you prestige in an established company or in any company with more than 20 or 50? What gives you prestige in companies? Success. success. Well, what does success mean? Budget and budget. Headcount and budget, okay? One billion euro business unit, and I have X thousand people. That gives you prestige. Now, what's the problem here? It's the contrary. So actually, to do innovation right, you need no people, no titles, and no money. Innovation is actually not expensive when you do it right at the early stages. There's a moment where you can invest in technology and then costs go up. 
But that's a bit later down, right? So you gradually invest more. Today, this is where we're getting to culture, still a lot of companies, they make what I read at uh, Rita McGrath for lunch today. If you don't know Rita McGrath, look up her stuff. She's a Columbia Business School professor, I think the more, number one thinker in strategy. She says, companies today, they still make wild ass gambles. They make big bets on big ideas, and they make few of those. Rather than taking the startup approach and saying, nah, it's probably not very safe to invest in something we don't even know is going to work. So you gradually work yourself towards that vision. You can have a big vision, but to make sure it's not a hallucination, you do it gradually with these small experiments. So this is the chart I use to sell this whole agile process and lean startup to senior executives in, country, in companies around the world. Because if I use lean startup, they're going to say, startup, that's not for me. <laughs> I have a 10, 20, 100 billion euro business. I don't care about startup stuff. So I just show them this. Now, slowly moving to culture. What does this require? What do we really need to be good at to do this? Okay? In order to do what I just said. Decrease risk systematically and gradually experiment more and more and more. What do I need to be really good at? What's my core skill? What's my core skill? What do you think? Just give me a couple of things. What does that mean? Oh, like, yeah, see it as a child, you know, um, yeah, great, absolutely. Definitely important one. Learning, you said? What do you need to do to learn, actually? What do you need to do? Listen, okay. Where does the learning come from here? From experiments, okay? What is probably going to happen when you experiment and you have no clue yet if it's going to work or not? You're going to fail. So your biggest skill is to take in failures the whole day long. So the better you're at failing, and I know failing is not the goal, don't get me wrong, the better you're at failing, the more likely you are to reduce risk, okay? So as an innovator, an entrepreneur, as somebody who's building new products, you need to be world class at getting humiliated the whole fucking day. <laughs> and if you can't take that, because you're arrogant and you believe in your ideas and you think you got it right from the beginning, there's not a chance you're going to innovate without wasting a lot of time, money, and energy. Okay? So, I don't remember why I got to this point, but I wanted to say something strong, but like Swiss never do it usually. <laughs> but the point is, you need to be really good at experimentation, which includes being really good at failure. What does failure mean in most companies still? I know it's a cliche, but it's actually unfortunately true. What does failure mean in most companies? End your career. You end your career. So, a bad plan, a bad career plan, is to do innovation in most companies around the world. It's actually not a bad plan, it's career suicide. Who of you does innovation in established companies? That's career suicide. You like having fun, you want to be the pirate, but you're killing your career, okay? Still in many companies, and I'm sure you're working in some companies that are way beyond that and much better, okay? So the question is, how can we design the company where we can do this systematically so it's not career suicide. So the innovators and entrepreneurs can live in established companies. Because I think entrepreneurship is great. It's pretty tough. If you can do entrepreneurship in established companies, you have access to certain resources that make your life as an entrepreneur a lot easier. There's some VC firms that are actually replicating what you could get inside large companies. They're replicating that for the startup system. Andreessen and Horowitz are typically doing that. Okay. I want to get to the exercises pretty quickly. It's called workshop, and I'm going on blah, blah, blah. Sorry for that. Still okay until now? Is this interesting? Who learned something so far? A little bit? <laughs> Take a big risk here. Who still wants to learn or is hoping any, is they're going to learn at one point? <laughs> Good. Okay. More hands went up for this one. So what does this mean? Just quickly, last sketch. And then I'll show you the culture point. In any company, when 
you live longer than two, three years, and you have more than, let's say, 10, 20 employees, you're going to have a certain gap between existing business models that kind of work or work really well, and new growth engines that you need to create. Okay? So here we're in the space of improving what we have that really works. I'll give you an example. If I'm Nestle and I make yogurt, I actually know the business model of selling, making and selling yogurt extremely well. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try to improve this more and more, maybe come up with new yogurts, etc. But I'm going to improve this. And here I'll make business plans because it's mainly about execution. I know the business. I know the environment. I know the customers. Here you don't need to fail. Actually, failure is forbidden on this side. Over here, we have that crazy approach, which is you know, the more the iterative approach, where we're trying to invent. Okay? Now here's the challenge. And I'm telling you it starts with small companies because we already have this challenge. We have one business model that works really well, but it's not very scalable, so we're working on the scalable part in parallel. It requires a different mindset. Here, what's the core skill? To be really good at execution. You have KPIs, and you need to stick to those. You need to be good at planning and processes. This is not agile. Here, you need to be extremely good at experimentation at failing and learning. The objective is not even to learn, it's actually to make the right decisions to grow a business. Okay? The objective is never to fail, it's never to learn, the objective is to make good decisions to grow a business. Okay? This is a completely different organizational culture. Now let's take Kodak, a nice simple example. <laughs> Who of you has ever lived a Kodak moment? <laughs> Some of you are too young. <laughs> I look young because of the Swiss Alps, but I'm actually really old already. Okay, another bad Swiss joke. It's going to get worse with the time going on. You're just getting bored. But um, what was I talking about? The Kodak. Today, nobody wants to have a Kodak moment because it stands for a company that had 130,000 employees and went out of business. So you could say, ah, but they were not innovative. Who of you thinks Kodak went out of business because they didn't innovate enough? Hands up. Who of you thinks they went out of business because they innovated a lot? Everybody else thinks it's a trick question. <laughs> Gee, I thought this Berlin is supposed to be entrepreneurial. Nobody's taking any risk here. What's going on? Okay, let's do this again. Okay, you can't, if you leave your hand down, you need to leave the room after. <laughs> Who of you thinks Kodak went out of business because they weren't innovative? Hands up. Okay. Who of you thinks Kodak went out of business because they were innovative? Okay, great. Split. Who of you didn't put your hand up? Please leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Bodyguards, get them out. <laughs> so, turns out, it was a bit of a trick question, they were extremely innovative, but they were very good at technology innovation, right? So their business model actually expired, which was a business model built around selling analog film. Their culture was all about better selling analog film. Their research department came up with a digital camera. They built the digital camera and they sold a shitload of them, but they didn't have a business model that would allow the company to grow. This business model of the new digital cameras actually killed the old ones, so it literally cannibalized the old business model. Why? Because they didn't spend any time figuring out the right business model and value proposition for digital cameras, or for digital photos. Got me on that? Different culture. So while they did technology R&D, they didn't experiment with new business models and value propositions. They didn't have this skill. And today, I'd say 90% of the companies in the world, they don't have this skill to create new growth engines while they're successful. Very few companies, and the one company I'll show is Amazon. What is Amazon known for? What's their business? Tell me. Might want to work in this room. What's their business, Amazon? What do they do? They sell stuff, okay? That's maybe 80% of their business. What was the fastest growth engine and the most profitable growth, growth engine for Amazon the last 10 years? Amazon Web Services, right? 
Are those similar businesses? What do you think? They're actually very different, but they have very strong synergies, right? One is B2B selling to companies, one is selling stuff to consumers. What's the synergy? Obviously, the back end. In the business small canvas, we call it the backstage. Most companies would, if somebody said, hey, we want to do Amazon Web Services, most companies would have said, are you fucking crazy? We're an e-commerce company, we sell stuff. You want to sell cloud, you know, cloud storage and computing? capacity to other companies? Are you out of your mind? Except if you have a visionary at the head of the company and somebody who understands experimentation and who doesn't say, why the fuck would we do that? But who says, why not? Let's try it. If we fail, we fail cheaply. If we succeed, we succeed, succeed big. Okay? So he gave this space. He, Jeff, Jeff Bezos was not the person who invented it. He's the person who created the organizational culture for this to live and thrive. The entrepreneurs behind it, if you want, were able to build a business inside Amazon, which would have been a lot harder on their own. Okay? So, what I want to get into now is what can we do to create what we would call the ambidextrous company, or a dual operating system. World class at execution, and we're world class at inventing shit. Very hard to do simultaneously because it requires two different cultures. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to do. Let me see if I can switch here. And for that, I'll go to the slides. And what we're going to talk about is this new tool that we helped develop with our team at Strategizer. It's called the Culture Map. Who of you has ever heard of the Culture Map? Okay, quite a few. So I'll tell you, I'll give you a cool exercise to do in a bit, and I'll let Dave Gray, who invented this tool, talk about it. Who's of you has heard of Dave Gray? I mentioned him before, right? Dave Gray. Entrepreneur, visual thinker, um, but also really interested in creating new concepts. So I showed you this part, right? Execution and experimentation. What we're going to ask ourselves is how can we create this kind of culture? And the tool we're going to look at you can actually use it um, elsewhere as well. So very quickly, I just want you to discuss with your seat neighbor for a minute, what is organizational culture? What is it? I want you to define it and just maybe pick the five core elements of organizational culture. Okay, just for one minute. Let's go. Talk with your seat neighbor. What's organizational culture? <laughs> I usually have a Swiss cowbell, but I actually lost it. So I may not have it with me. Or somebody stole it. They were so annoying with me. Okay, what are the elements of corporate culture? Just give me a couple things. What are the core pillars of organizational culture? Tell me. Anybody? Values. Okay. Habits. Habits. Okay. Leadership. Leadership. Okay. Purpose. Purpose. Okay. People. People. Language. Language. Tons of stuff, right? Space. Space. Now, what do you think? If we wrote down a definition in groups of two, would all the definitions look the same? Would we all have the same definition of organizational culture and all choose the same pillars? No. Absolutely not, right? So, it's the same with when we started out with business models and value propositions. This is what you get. Everybody, you know, it's this simple word, like business models or value propositions. Oh, that's clear what that is. You get people to define it, it's a mess. You might remember this. This is actually a painting by Bruegels. They, it's about you know a Christian religion. They wanted to build a tower that goes to heaven. Then God came down, created languages, and they couldn't build the tower. We have the same thing when it comes to organizational culture. Nobody's talking about the same thing. Nobody has a shared understanding. How are you going to build organizational culture, design organizational culture, when you don't even know what you're talking about? It's very similar when it comes to strategy, business models, and value propositions. But since we learned for business models, we can create tools to design them intentionally, we thought with Dave Gray, what if we could do this for culture? So I'll give you a simple definition. Okay, corporate culture is the values, beliefs, and behaviors practiced in an organization. But here's the thing no, nobody brought up, actually. Culture is the habits, blah, 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 of a group. These form over time because they are rewarded or punished. Nobody put rules maybe rich 
rituals into culture. But culture comes from somewhere, okay? So we'll take this and we'll add it to our definition. So all this formed over time, or forms over time because they are rewarded or punished by formal, informal rules, rituals, behaviors, etc. Okay, definition will get us a little bit more aligned. But what I'm interested in is a tool that allows us to intentionally design corporate culture. So, if we could map systematically culture in a team, we could actually do a lot better job at it. So Dave, Dave Gray, he approached us with this. This was his tool. And I consider myself a toolsmith, and Dave is a good friend, but I said, you really hope any kind of senior executive or any person in the world is going to adopt this if they're not, you know, kind of tool nuts like ourselves? It's too complicated. It's not yet a tool. It's a concept. So together with him and Yves Pinier, my co-author, we started to iterate and prototype, just like we would do for a product, the tool, the business tool. So obviously, you talk about culture, you need some kind of iceberg, and you notice that doesn't really work, and you come up with something simpler. And then we came up with a really silly thing with three blocks, three simple blocks, and I'll get into them in a, in a bit. Outcomes, behaviors, enablers, and blockers, okay? And this tool works miracles to design organizational culture. So, in the middle you have the visible part of culture, the behaviors. And the behaviors, like uh, we collaborate, um, we go for beers or whatever, leads to certain outcomes, great company culture or results, etc. But these things only happen because there's certain enablers and blockers. We reward people to experiment. We punish people who don't collaborate, all that kind of stuff, right? That leads to culture over time. It's not just what we say, it's actually what we do. So values are great, and if they're not lived, nobody gives a shit about values, right? It's what we live. So, I'll let Dave Gray talk about this. I'll maybe fast forward a bit. But he has a nice way to describe how you can intentionally design culture. And then we're going to get to innovation culture, okay? Want to listen to Dave Gray talk about culture? So we have a video. I have a video that was not designed for this event. Sorry, guys. It was in, in designed for another event that we did. It was a strategizer boot camp with 32 um, strategizer coaches who we trained for five days, 60 hours. It was a real boot camp. It was tough. Um, but they learned about the culture map at the end. So I'm going to let Dave talk about this. Hi, everyone. Fast this forward. This is Dave Gray. Uh, Alex Osterwalder asked me to join you by Skype today, and I wasn't available. I'm going to be uh, traveling. I'll just play it, but there you go. I did want to join you as best I can, so uh, I suggested we record a I record a video and share it with you this way. And um, I will be checking uh, Twitter if you do want to ask questions and put them out to me. I'm uh, at Dave Gray on Twitter, D-A-V-E-G-R-A-Y. And if you just uh, um, at me on Twitter or um, let me know in uh, some other way, contact me. I'll be happy to answer questions and thoughts, give thoughts on this if you want to follow up. The, um, uh, but what, I, what Alex asked me to do is kind of give an overview of the culture map and talk a little bit about how we've been using it in our practice with clients. And so I'm going to do that now. So you're actually getting the okay, culture map now? Culture map. Uh, this is how we, uh, the latest version, there are many other iterations that we went through. Alex can tell you the story of that. There were several different ways that we thought about approaching it, and this is the way that we ended up uh, going. Um, I'm going to uh, grab a little uh, pencil tool, and I'm going to kind of draw through this, and kind of draw it and discuss it as we go. But uh, the most, you'll notice that uh, it appears pretty simple. That's probably the first thing that most people notice. There's actually just three uh, simple categories. The uh, top one is outcomes. The middle one is behaviors. And the bottom one is called enablers and blockers. And these are all things that are related. And I want to talk you through this the way that I talk anyone through that I'm introducing to the map. So the first question that people have is, many people is, what is this, where does this idea that culture can be designed come from? The idea that culture is something that can be designed. For some people, it's almost a that. They just find it uh, a bothersome, an irritating idea. 
Culture is something that's organic, it's natural, it's human. It happens whenever humans uh, congregate and work together. Uh, it's not something you should design, it's not something that you can design, and it's not something that you should design. Now, I, Alex and I have a different opinion. We believe that culture is something, and yes, that it is something that happens organically. It happens whenever people, whenever two people interact together in um, sharing a goal or a purpose, they are creating culture. In fact, whenever two people interact, two or more people interact together anyway, they are creating culture. So it's, it's even for startups, right? It's sort of the, the collective behavior of a group, the habits, if you will, of a group. Now, what I'm, uh, I'm going to show you here is how we think of culture design. The metaphor that we like to use is a garden. If you think about a garden, um, there is a, a soil and a climate within which you can you plant seeds to grow a garden. You, can, you can't design a garden in the same way that you design a car or a physical product where you meet every specification of the garden. You can design the parameters within which the garden grows. You can design, um, you know, you, but you have to take into account certain factors. There is the climate. You're not going to, here in St. Louis where I live, we have cold winters. You're not going to be able to grow palm trees here, for example. Uh, you will be able to grow uh, corn and other things that are, um, you know, suitable for a temperate climate. So if you think about the, the soil, the enablers and blockers down here, this is the soil. This is where you're going to plant the seeds, and this is the uh, this is the environment that you have, uh, the climate, the environment that you are able to create within your company. Sometimes you're if you're in a startup, you're starting from scratch, in which case that's awesome. And uh, you can be very intentional about the culture you want to create. Sometimes, or more often perhaps, you're, you're not starting from scratch. You're starting with an existing culture, which means you have already a climate. You have some things that um, have become customs in the company, and that the company's become accustomed to. So the enablers and blockers, these are, I think, in some ways the most important aspect of the culture map, because these are where you as a, as a leadership or a management team, you actually can control things. And because of the enablers and blockers we put into place, certain behaviors happen. Behaviors is just the things that we do every day. The things that we do, the routines, the habits, as the organization that we have established. So this is just the, the behaviors is the, is the core of the culture map because that's what culture is. Culture is the collective behavior of a group. And if, if the enablers and blockers are set up in the right way, you get the behaviors that you want. And if you get the behaviors that you want, um, and you do that successfully, then you get the outcomes that you want, the, uh, the actual fruits of the garden, the things, whatever they are, that you're growing. I'm not sure what these are, maybe they're flowers. But, you know, depending on how these things interrelate, the enablers and blockers causing behaviors or influencing them, the behaviors causing or influencing outcomes, um, you get to some degree the culture that you want. Okay, so you get the point, and the idea here is, let me just skip this part, but you can design culture the way you design a car, but what you can do is you can design culture the way you design a garden. The problem is just that most companies nor startups, nor large companies, established companies, intentionally design culture. But it's crucial, and when it comes to innovation culture, it's even more important. So, what I gave you is a little exercise we're going to do in a second. Let me just introduce this, because as I said before, Amazon was very good at creating an innovation culture, where Amazon Web Services could grow. And actually some analysts say that they're doing something else, which might become the biggest business inside Amazon. Anybody know what analysts today, some analysts are saying, this might actually be Amazon's biggest success ever. What are they doing right now? What are they doing? What are they doing? Now, let's get with the Fire Oh, the Fire Yeah, that's, that's actually a good example of a culture where you can fail. And that was the CEO <laughs> of it. And we'll talk about that. What is it that, they, that they're doing now that some people say this is gonna, this is the biggest thing. 
the Echo, Amazon Echo voice control. And they're doing it actually a lot better than anybody else, better than Apple and better than Google. We'd say, oh, those are the guys who know how to do that shit because they're building phones. Well, it turns out Amazon is a lot better and, and many VCs are now acknowledging that Amazon is really good at voice control, okay? So, that is happening because they're very good, not just at this, like Amazon is world class at logistics and selling and shipping stuff. Nobody's better. They're world class. It's impossible to be better than that, okay? And they continue to focus on getting better and better at this. But at the same time, they build completely new businesses, like Amazon Web Services, like Echo. The question is, why can they do what Nestle can't do? What Deutsche Telekom, I hope nobody's in the room from Deutsche Telekom, what they can't do, okay? Just joking, I'm sure somebody's here. Okay. Listen well, and do it. So, if we just look at, there's a little bit of a history here, some of the things that they did, we're going to focus on this one specifically. Now, if you look at, since everybody seemed to have heard of the business model canvas, I'm not going to introduce this, this is their business model for selling stuff, right? They have a couple of things here in the backstage, and they just sell stuff, and they have a very low sales margin on it. The problem here is actually, sales margins were disastrous, and still are not very good. But it led to a very effective and very cheap IT infrastructure. A lot cheaper than Google because Google is sitting on gold, gold mine they have money to waste. Okay? So guess what? Their infrastructure is not very effective. It's very good, but it's freaking expensive. Okay? So um, let's put a, like a tracing paper over this business model and ask ourselves, how does Amazon Web Services relate to this? Well, it turns out, it uses the same backbone, okay? The same, what I like to call, backstage of the business model to do something completely different, which was to sell Amazon Web Services first to internet companies and today to established players like pharma companies, etc., with a lot higher margins. Pretty powerful. Again, the question is not, what do they do here? The question is, why can they systematically do this kind of stuff? Why can they do that? Results here, 200% annual growth. It's now going to be a $10 billion business. Uh, this year, pretty impressive. Now, what we're interested in is how did Amazon create an innovation culture that can systematically spit out new innovations, not like Kodak, but innovations that also have value propositions and business models that can flourish. Okay? So, I just your, I but I brought a little exercise with me. You have the letter to shareholders by Amazon and by Jeffrey Bezos. He sent this in the last annual report. He had three pages first with this shareholder letter. And in this letter, he describes why they were able to, see up there, to create an in invention machine. He describes basically what other companies should do if they want it to be as good as Amazon, okay? So, they are actually pretty good at failure. Before they came up with a couple of success cases, they had Amazon Local, they had Amazon Auctions, all big flops, Amazon, you know, Kindle Fire, big flops. But they're okay with that because it's part of the process. In most companies, you get fired, in this case it was the CEO, too bad. Um, but in most cases, this is not seen as a good thing. At Amazon, it's seen as a normal thing on the path to creating new stuff, okay? So, how does he create an innovation culture? That's the exercise that you're going to work on. So, you got this um, letter to shareholders. You're going to read it individually, but you also got stickers, okay? And the stickers are little components, little pieces from the letter to shareholders. What I want you to do is to see if you can take this actually prototype exercise, we haven't done it too often, if you can take these different components and put them at the right place in the culture map. Are we talking about outcomes? Are we talking about behaviors that he's mentioning? Are we talking about enablers and blockers, okay? So your task is to take this, oops, no! 
Okay, what are the things we need to put in place? So let's look at this quickly. Here in the middle, what do we have? We have certain behaviors. This is what you would want to see in a company that's good at doing lean startup, innovation culture. We act on evidence, not opinion. Okay? So decision makers can't say, I like this, I don't like this. They can say, oh, that evidence is very strong. Oh, this evidence sucks. Can you bring me more? That's acting on evidence, not opinion. We test before we execute. We don't write business plans that we execute, but we make small experiments. We start with cheap experiments. So, you know, making, who of you has ever heard of Better Place? Anybody heard of Better Place? They built a whole battery swapping infrastructure, which is the most expensive experiment you can do to prove a business is going to work. And unfortunately, they lost $850 million in the process. And that's not a very good cheap experiment. Okay? We test problems, then solutions. So who of you is uh, in a technology company or is an engineer or something like that? Okay, what do you like to do? You like to build shit. Okay? When I say test, what do you think? I make a prototype of this thing so I can show it to people. And I'm going to ask them, hey, what do you think of this prototype? Do you like it? And what is she going to say? Yes, no, maybe. But the problem is, I frame the conversation, the experiment, around what I think is important, or interesting, or doable. But I might not know that she doesn't care about this at all, because what she's really struggling with is this. But since I framed the conversation around this, we're here. So what if I put this in the back of my mind and I ask, okay, so what are the biggest things you struggle with during your day, and you know, what are the things you're trying to get done, etc.? I framed it around what matters to her, not to me. That's what I mean with testing problems, not solutions. Okay? So simple stuff, but that we want to put in place systematically. Okay? So that's where it gets interesting. We reward experiments, we celebrate learning from failure, we have middle management that supports this whole approach, we have execution and innovation that collaborate. And here's a good one. People choose innovation as a career path. Who have you in a company where you could really say innovation, new stuff, failing and experimenting is a real career path that can lead to the very top? It's pretty rare. Okay? Try to do that. Good. One person in the entire room. Okay. So, what does that lead to? Why are we doing it? Very general, we saw that, okay? Reduced innovation risk, higher return on R&D, and ultimately that leads to new growth engines. Here's one thing, what I mean, higher return on R&D means turning technology into value propositions and business models. Remember Kodak, the Kodak example? They had great R&D. This is that nobody bothered to turn the really interesting new stuff for the future into value propositions and business models. It's a bit black and white. They tried way too late. Okay? So R&D, doing technology shit, really is not enough. <sighs> Rude language today, sorry. I'm tired. Company designed for the future, retention of innovation talent. Actually, the biggest issue of larger companies, those of you who had your hands up, is Established larger companies are retaining all of the execution talent. And they're losing all of the innovation talent, the people who can invent the future. Because guess what? They're leaving and building their own companies. And in some cases, they might actually disrupt the company they left. Right? Nice. Okay, so what we're really interested in, and here I want you to have a quick conversation after, is what could we put in place down here in terms of drivers, behaviors that, that really influence behavior, behaviors and outcomes? So the question to you is what do we put in here? I'll give you the things that you don't want to have in here, the blockers that you need to kill, burn, eliminate, and then you, a minute exercise, will come up with things you want to have in here. Okay, what shouldn't we have? Number one, any company that requires business plans cannot innovate with low risk because they're maximizing their risk for failure. If you're in a company that requires business plans, leave now. <laughs> Not this place, but your company. Okay? You can also leave now because uh, you're doomed anyway. So, okay? Linear, not agile processes. All of you are trying to bring linear processes into uh, agile processes into your companies. Lack of knowledge. Here's a big one. Like we all talk lean startup in our communities. We're passionate about this stuff. But when you really dig deeper, 
There are very few people in established companies that actually know how really to do experiments, other than making prototypes and showing it to customers or doing surveys. It's not that easy if you're at Colgate to do experiments that you're going to get through legal without you know, being thrown out of the company. But you can do it, but there's, a little, there's little knowledge. A lot of the lean startup stuff is done really, it's mediocrity at, at best. I think we can be a lot better, better than that. Failure is career suicide in most companies. The incentive structure, what do we reward in companies? We pay them to be good at executing plans. Remember, if you have a vision, you make a plan, you execute, you're probably going to execute a hallucination. We need to have different reward structures, okay? And innovation, I mentioned this one, is not prestigious. Okay, that's the stuff you don't want to do. Question to you, okay? What do we want to do? So the idea here is, I like this from a friend of mine, he said, I explained this and he said, oh, so you're telling me with this tool I can wireframe. I can prototype culture. I said, yes! You can even test it with the Lean Startup approach. So the point is, we can go from an as-is, present state culture, but we can go from an existing culture to a desire to be culture that we're going to prototype and implement. So, if you're managing a team, your first conversation probably shouldn't be around the desired culture. It probably should be around Okay, what's our culture today? How do we feel about it? And you can only do that if you're a leader who really created a space where people can freely talk. Not that many leaders are good at that, right? Because people are afraid to tell the truth. Oh, your decisions suck. What? I hear that all the time. <laughs> okay, so what do we do? What do we create? Task to you is what do, we, oops, what do we put down here in terms of sticky notes, things that enable, enable the kind of culture I mapped out before? And I'm going to put it up again in a second. So in groups of two, quick conversation. What are the few enablers you would, would want to put down here that lead to a lean startup culture, the culture you desire? OK, let's go. Two minutes. Use the same thing. Um, and just scribble some stuff down. This is the bottom layer you're starting to fill out. Okay, let's do this together. This was more to activate your brains after my bad jokes. Okay. So, what are the things you came up with? What are the things you came up with? What do we want to have down here in the enablers, maybe blockers? Give me some stuff. Space. Space, the right type of space. When you say space, what kind of space do you mean? Right, it could be physical space and a mental space, okay, excellent. Or a safe space, right? We don't have a safe space to experiment. What else? Autonomy. Autonomy, right? And we don't want the people always telling us we have to go back to ask. Can we do this experiment? Can we do that? Can we do that? Excellent, it's a good one. What else? Diversity. Diversity. We want to maybe run several experiments. We don't want to have a guideline. You're going to explore that market and that's the only customer segment you're allowed to look at. So tools. constraints are good, but too many, not so good. What else? Tools. Tools, right? Great. There's the business small canvas. There's even a company that makes stuff like this called Strategize. <laughs> Frameworks, right? Or processes to point out the evidence, to learn how to do that, the skills actually. Data literacy, right? Because not everybody was actually trained to do good experiments. So most experiments are a disaster because they look at one variable and they have about 100 variables they're not controlling. So how are you actually going to figure out that data? Okay, so a lot of stuff. Um, I would categorize them in three areas. Okay, three areas and then I'll give you a couple of things. Pretty high level. But you want to do certain things in the leadership space. You want to do certain things in the culture and process space, and you want to do th certain things in the organizational design space. It's still pretty abstract, but these are the three areas you should cover. Let's look at the first one. Well, guess what? Leadership support helps. And it turns out, top leadership often actually supports this kind of culture, but it's middle management that blocks it. Resource allocation. Oh, so we said we're going to explore business models, but we're putting billions in R&D and none of that money for technology R&D 
actually goes to exploring business models and value propositions. So resource allocation seems obvious, but guess what? People, when they say innovation, they put it in technology. Technology is not innovation, and nobody gives a shit. In particular, customers don't give a shit about technology. They care about value propositions, and you care about business models. Right? We don't have enough money for that. Legitimacy and power. Small anecdote here, actually. Um, Swiss are not very provocative, but every now and then we try to be. So I was at 3M, you guys who make post-it notes, I was talking to the Global Marketing Council, and I said, if you took, say, 5% of your R&D budget, because they're really good at R&D, okay? They suck at business models. Really good at R&D, world class, number one, case study in every business school. They took 5% of that money, and they allocated it to research around business models and value propositions, I told them, you will double your revenues, billions and billions of dollars, you will double your revenues in less than five years. I think, seriously, I think they could do it. The problem is, their business is still going reasonably well, so there is no hunger to actually do it. They kind of looked at me and said, nice, okay, good, next slide. <laughs> so much, like, just we can't be provocative enough. Lean Startup Champions, you want to take those success cases and make them visible. Lean Startup ritual, Rituals, you want to celebrate failure and learning and show, hey, we fucked this up, but this is what we learned and we managed the failure and it was cheap and it didn't have an impact on our brand and this is what it led to, okay? Agile processes. Here's the hardest part. Skills development is easy, but there are two things in organizational design that are really hard. The structure and the reward system. You need a different structure and reward system for execution than you need for building great new growth engines. So guess what? People are not most motivated by money, but if you just built a billion dollar growth engine or billion euro growth engine for your company, and all you get is a bonus of a couple of ten thousand you know, euro, it's nice money, but don't you feel a bit you know, abuse, like you just built a billion euro business for your company. You get a promotion and some more money. This is not going to help, even if money is not the biggest, don't get me wrong, it's not the biggest motivator. Guess what? What are these people going to do? They're going to leave and they're going to build the next big opportunity outside. Okay? So we need different incentive systems, including the financial ones. The other ones are easier than actually the financials. And then here's the big one, last one, then I'll stop and shut up and ask, um, answer questions. Building a bridge to the core business. What is it that established companies have that startups don't have? What do they have? What do they have? They have money, okay, one resource. What else do they have? They have resources in terms of people. What else do they have? They have customers, right? Why is that a big thing? Because as a startup, what's the hardest thing? Technology is not hard as a startup. If you're an engineer, it's easy. What's hard? Customers. Okay? If you have a sales force that's feeding millions of customers, you actually could test with a lot of people. It's just that today, what does the sales force tell you? The sales people, what do they tell you if you want to talk to their customers? They give you this one. <laughs> okay, this one, not for you. That was the sales people driven. <laughs> Desperate jokes, right? <laughs> That's not even supposed to be a joke. That's the worst part of it. Okay, so salespeople, they say to people who want to do testing with their customers because they don't want them to mess with their customer relationship. It's just that if large companies don't build a bridge to their core business for their entrepreneurs, guess what? Those are entrepreneurs in chains and they cannot innovate, they cannot come up with new stuff. Okay? Same for product managers. You want to be a product manager in chains doing new stuff. Okay, so I'll stop here. Um, play around a little bit with culture. Um, let me take a very risky one here. Who actually learned something this evening? Good! <laughs> Those who didn't, they already left. <laughs> Not that risky. Okay, so um, I still have, I'd say, a couple minutes for Q&A. Try to keep it short. My wife always says I talk too much. So.
Does it, does it work? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this device in my hands is the so-called catch box, and we will throw it through the room. And when you pick it, when you lift your arm, you can use it to ask a question. So, yes. That was risky. Hello? Uh, would you say that... <laughs> it works? I can throw this one. Yeah, uh, wouldn't you say that uh, improving an existing business model is an innovation on a shorter scale? So, um, I wouldn't say this is on a shorter scale. Usually it is the case. Um, the way you want to look at it is, when you talk improve, invent, the big difference is not the time. The big difference is what you know and what you don't know. Okay, so let me just get that on this super, super duper slide here. So, the point is, Amazon knows how to sell stuff. They know how to run logistics. They know how to do that. Over here, they have no clue how to sell to other businesses. So, it's just that there are a lot more uncertainties. The time frame isn't that important. Of course, it's something you want to manage. But the real variable you want to look at is over here, there's a lot less stuff you know. That's why you can't plan. Planning is not the point here. Planning experiments, yes, but it's not the point here. Over here, you have a lot more certainty. That's the main difference between improving and inventing. That's why improving is a lot less, less risky. But you will never invent the future over here. There's a McKinsey framework you want to look at um, called the Horizon Model. Who has heard of the Three Horizon Model? Okay. It's used a lot now in, in established companies where they say, Horizon 1 is about improving our existing businesses, so it's closer to our core market. Horizon 3 is about stuff that's out there where we have no clue. Okay? So you'll have a different approach, different culture over here, than in H3. It's a way of looking at it. Okay, who has a question? You can throw it, that's an easy throw. From any culture. Yeah? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a deep here. Um, so, um, so actually your picture there is, is quite soothing. Um, I was wondering um, when you were, were talking about giving the, like, all the freedom and, and um, needs to, be, to, to allow for inventing new things um, and then you don't need this to improve existing models so you have more constraints. Um, so why... Different constraints. Oh, different constraints, okay. So why... Um, uh, see there um, is that in established companies we have often set up these like cool kids, new place, new ventures, blah blah blah. Yeah. My company, new ventures. Yeah. And then all of a sudden these are the cool kids. Yeah. And then usually they fail at building the bridge and reintegrating with sure. the classic company. Sure. So how do you? Um, I have not yet learned today how actually um, you can have a coexistence of those. Okay, so the first thing is that the reason you have that is because in most companies we have this myth that innovation is about the creative genius, it's about the cool kids who know the cool technology, that's BS. It's a process. Of course you need people who know how to deal with that, but you also need people who can make a spreadsheet and who actually know what costs money and what doesn't make money and what earns money, okay? So you need a team of people who have all of those skills, and some of them will come from this side. So the reason we have that is because we have this myth of innovation, that it's the cool kids, the entrepreneurs, etc. That is what Steve Blank, Steve Blank is the inventor of the whole lean startup movement, and I, that's what we call innovation theater. It's, it's play. It's like teenage sex. Talk about it. It's not the real thing. <laughs> so that is not what I call innovation. And it actually gives innovation a bad rep. Even worse is when we call the innovators, and I just heard this term today, we call them the pirates. What do you do with pirates? You kill them. You hang them. Great, how's that going to create a bridge? So what we need to create today doesn't exist. 
And in the case of Amazon, what they did do, and what more and more companies are starting to understand, is there's one big thing that innovation is lacking today, the people who do innovation. What are they lacking? Power. Power. The power today is with the CEO. What does CEO stand for? Chief Execution Officer which is basically managing the present in most companies. Also because their incentives depend on the stock market and the present. They have the power. The question is, who then has the power to invent the future? So in their case, the CEO, and Google tried it in a very different way, the CEO doesn't manage the existing. It's not a chief execution officer. The CEO creates the culture. Jeff Bezos has the power to create that culture to do this. So the big thing that's missing, I think, is power and legitimacy. Innovators today, sorry to say that, anybody who's innovation today, most of you are probably somewhere in the garage. She's already leaving as I'm saying it. <laughs> in the garage of somebody who's at the same level, same power, and these two people, he or she, they both report to the executive chairman of the board, okay? But what we're interested in is this, two people at the same power level in the org chart, the chief corporate entrepreneur, his or her only task is to build the future. His or her only task is to manage the present. Both are important. But the fact is today, you have this, you rarely have this. That is the key, which is going to be very hard. So we wrote a Harvard Business Review called blog post about this, just to provoke people and said, you want these two, everybody say, ah, it's going to be a war, blah, blah, blah. Actually, the war today is not happening between these two. It's between the entrepreneur and who? Who do you think wants to kill the chief entrepreneur, if there's anything like that? Who has the biggest vested interest to kill the chief entrepreneur in companies today? The founder. The head of R&D. It's not even the CFO. CFO wants a future, a financial future. It's the head of R&D who thinks innovation is their domain, but that's technology innovation. Oh, that was a long answer, sorry. Last question. Did that give you a little bit of an answer? A piece of it. Yes, uh, Great. but I will give some last to you. <laughs> These are topics we could talk for very long. You choose, yeah. I like this. <laughs> Nobody wants this rotation. Okay. Um, I, I saw this uh, Kinevin framework on David Snowden before, and when we talked about bridging, um, it came up to my mind that he talked about the harvesting stuff that comes into the complicated domain from chaos to um, yeah. Yep. And this reminds me of this bridging and culture and processes. And yeah. Company. Have you tried to map it also to this, this kind of complexity thinking? Who? Um, no. <laughs> I'm sure we could. <laughs> I'm sure we could. Um, I think so. I'm passionate about making tools for practitioners. I love concepts, I love frameworks. But what I really love is tools that make a difference for business people. I think there are a lot of great thinkers out there that make things more complicated than they have to be. They use fancy words like chaos theory, complex, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? The CEO sees that, the first thing he's going to do is put the book aside. Most of them. So I think there's a lot out there that could be used to design more tools. We created three. Two ourselves, business model canvas, value proposition canvas, one, actually two now with somebody else. You want to look up. Do you want me to give you the one really cool tool that we're going to brand pretty soon? Nobody knows about yet, but I could tell you. <laughs> huh? okay, so the culture map you've seen, that's already known. That was one we co developed with somebody else. We didn't do the hard work, conceptual work. We helped turn it into a tool that people, business people, would use. There's another one coming out. It's called, write it down, Google it, the team alignment map. 
and with the team alignment map, you will never fail a project again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've bet a million dollars on it. <laughs> so anyways, a long, long um, um, answer to the fact that I think there's a lot of cool concepts out there, but most business thinkers don't do that extra step because they don't necessarily know how to turn it into tools that business practitioners like yourselves and myself that we, we can use in every day's work without having to go through the translation of the fancy words to the real thing. It's just like design thinking. Why did design thinking take 20 years to take off? Because at the beginning it was intellectual masturbation and it wasn't practical enough. Nobody laughed. I was just wondering what's going to happen. So that was an experiment from my side. I do that in, in Ohio and you're not going to get out of the room. Um, but what was I talking about? Anyways, way too long. <laughs> Last question, last question. Do you, you want another question or do you want, no, she, want to, she wants to leave. Okay, sorry for that. Thank you very much for your attention today.